have you ever turned down an opportunity? I got offered six figures. Uh, this is the, one of the biggest offers that I monetarily, it was one of the biggest offers I've ever got. Uh, I was offered six figures, uh, by jelly roll. And he wanted me to come down to Nashville and live with him and be his photo video guy. And I inevitably turned it down. Not because I don't love jelly roll. I love that dude to death. Welcome to the Mike Squires and friends podcast. I'm typically your host, Mike Squires, but today's episode's a little different. The Mike Squires and friends podcast is a new podcast. So at this point, everything is new, but I'm doing something where the last episode of each year is going to be an interview that I do kind of reflecting on the year and talking about what I think is going to happen in the following year. And Jet and I go way back. So I'm very thankful to have him here today, helping me with this. Now, if you want to support the Mike Squires and friends podcast, all you got to do is hit that subscribe button on YouTube or download on your preferred podcast platform. Now, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, and enjoy this episode of Mike Squires and Friends. I know you're usually used to seeing somebody else in this chair, but he's in that chair today. Let's go. Uh, today, I'm going to be sitting down talking with my good friend, Mike Squires. Um, Mike Squires, uh, you know, I mean, Anybody who watches the pod, you know who this guy is, uh, producer, uh, videographer, artist. I mean, the list goes on. Renaissance man. Whew. Swiss Army knife. How you doing, man? What an intro, dude. Yeah. I'm doing good, man. I'm happy to have you host the Mike Squires and Friends podcast today, I, dude. I appreciate the uh, the honor um, of being able to do this. Um, so let's just jump right into it. Um, what was it like growing up? Mike Squires? Uh, it was pretty good. You know, I grew up, like in my younger years, grew up, had both parents, you know, very supportive. Mm -hmm. I come from like a middle class, like upper, you know, I wasn't poor by any means, you know. Shout but, out the city if you can. Yeah, Stanford, Connecticut, born and raised, dude. Uh, very proud to be from Stanford. And uh, yeah, no, I, I grew, I had a very happy childhood. Yep. Yeah. Um, what made you get into video? So I got into video because I bought, I remember I used to play soccer as a kid, right? Okay. And I basically asked my dad to film a soccer game for me. And I like scored the one winning goal. And it was like the best game that I ever played. And I don't remember, I was young, but I know that I like did really well for my team in that game, right? So I went to go back to look at the footage that my dad had. And all of a sudden, the camera is just facing the grass the entire game. You hear him cheering. And I'm just, like, looking at the footage back. Like, the moment you hear everybody cheering for the goal that I scored, but all you see is grass. So at that moment, you know, I did some chores around the house. One thing I really enjoyed about my parents is that they really made me work for things. Like, I wasn't – they gave me a lot, too. But, like, for my first camera, my mom made me do chores, you know, to save up for that first camera. We went down to Radio Shack, rest in peace. And uh, I got my first camera and I started filming soccer videos. So that's how I initially picked up the camera. And, you know, eventually those soccer videos turned into comedy skits with my good friend Nick. And then those turned into music videos. And then, you know, until a full-fledged career where I'm at now. And um, how old would you say you were around this time? Were you I, like... I was young, dude. You know, I think... I start my video, like my music video career starts at 16, but I probably had a camera at like 12, 13. Well, yeah, yeah. So I've been in it for a little bit, dude. What would you say was the point in your career? Well, the point in your career where you felt like it's going to, it could turn into a career where you, you looked at it and said, I'm pretty good with this video stuff. I think maybe this might be my path. So I kind of got forced into it, but I'll give you a little backstory. So I remember I eventually, like, I got all my camera set up, right? I got, I was able to get a camera. I had a green screen at a time. And this is like probably like age 15, like, and I worked hard for this stuff, you know, whether it was like mowing the lawn, whatever chores I had to do to get this stuff, you know, I always had the passion for video. And then in 2011, I was 16 years old, my house burned down and I lost everything. So at that point, you know, all the equipment that I had just saved up for was gone in an instant. Insurance covered nothing. So it honestly became out of necessity. Obviously, I was going through a lot of other things in my life at that time. But I remember after my house burned down, I remember like looking in the mirror like the next day and like thinking, why me? Like, why did this happen to me? And I also remember not wanting to be remembered as the kid whose house burned down. Like that was one of my first things. I was like, yo, this isn't who I am. So basically through that, 
you know, I landscaped the entire summer after my house burned down, rebought the equipment. So, you know, it was the second time that I did this. And, uh, you know, I would take that camera and I would try to get as many gigs as I could. I'd reach out to everybody. I remember I did a florist video for like $50. It was definitely boo-boo. Keep in mind, I was like 16 just starting at the time. But so I would like do videos for 50 bucks because I needed money, dude, because insurance covered nothing. My mom at that time is a single mom, you know, like holding it up for myself and my sister Morgan. It's, it wasn't easy for her. So it became out of necessity. Like, and I was just trying to make money. So, you know, I would do these gigs. I was passionate about it, thankfully too. But I remember uh, like I did a gig at a chiropractor and the chiropractor blew me off. Like I just like drove all the way there, you know, and you know how it is in like the music game and anything. And inevitably I got into music videos and that's what started paying the bills. And we kind of met through there a little bit too. It was a little bit later, but you know, I started shooting music videos locally and you know, I'd get $200 here, 150 there, 300 there. And as a 16, 17 year old kid, like that's real money, dude. Yeah. So that's when it turned into a career. And because of these videos and every time you release a video, it basically is an advertisement, right? So you know, there are definitely people who are like, yo, this video is dope. Who did this? And that's, I basically got my name out just from word of mouth and just consistently doing it. Yeah. So, And also just if I could add something to it, I feel like, um, you know, in CT at the time, spe specifically in Stanford, there was a market for video guy, right? Yeah. And I feel like... Uh, at a certain point, you kind of monopolize that. I dominated that yeah, market, dude. Like, I mean, talk your shit. You know, get your, your, you know what I mean? Talk your shit. Like, I feel like that's how I met you, obviously. You know, um, I think it was, shout out Danny Aguilar. I think, shout out Danny, dude. Yeah, I think Danny was like, yo, this guy, you know what I mean? He goes to NCC Kid, and and he's nice with the videos. And I saw your videos. And at that time, I had not really seen anybody locally who had the quality you had. So I was like, damn. Yeah, like, you know what I mean? You really, like, you there was a supply and demand in the market and you met the uh you met the uh I got you know, into video yeah it. dude I got into video so early dude that's one thing I'm so thankful for and I really did I really felt like I had the market cornered cuz I just felt like there was a moment in Stanford and maybe this is why my love for the city is so because at one point you know everybody had a squires video dude yeah, and it was yeah. like kind of a thing to have and I, it's weird, like talking to myself, like talking about myself in that thing. But, it, you know, I really have had the opportunity to work with almost all of like Stanford's artists from like, you know, that era and even some of the ones that are coming up now, too. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so when when would you say you started seeing success as a director? Mm. You know, I think that it kind of leans into that where it's like locally, I'll talk locally and then I'll talk on a bigger scale. So you know, being the 16, 17 year old kid and getting these videos constantly, like it really changed my game because I went from, and you know, what's funny. I like, wasn't, I still was broke, but I was less for a 16 year old. Like when you're making that kind of money, like, you know, 300 bucks then is a lot different than 300 bucks now. Oh yeah. You're it, up. I think when I started like really getting views on videos, it was another Connecticut artist wit. And I worked with him pretty closely on a lot of his like OG music videos. And those videos ended up getting like millions of views and a lot of opportunities came from those. So that's well, probably the bigger scale. What was your first video that got a million views? It was definitely a wit video. It was, it was either kindest regards or like I do was the name of the other one. And like, it was cool. The one thing that I was really proud of, and I will take this to my grave is that, and somebody know what I know I'm right on this. Like I do was completely shot in Stanford, Connecticut. And that is the first video from Stanford, Connecticut to hit a million views. And I was very, I'm still very proud of that. That's dude. double confirmed. Double like, confirmed. Yeah. No one else hit a million from Stanford before that. Like music video wise, like an independent, like kind of artist, you know what I mean? So like, how did that feel to like, see like, something that you were creating on your laptop, desktop, you know, essentially in your room, you're editing, you're shot it, put it together. Right. Once you, you know, the, the weird thing about art, once you, it's in this, you know, little domicile of yours, like in your room, wherever you, you create, once you put it out there, now it's like, 
it's there. It's for the people. So to know that this little project you were working on, not literally, but like, you know, a project you were working on so personally in your room, in your own domain, now that you put it out, a million people have seen your video. Like, how did that fit? Was that like, I mean, it's really awesome. I can't lie to you, but at a certain point you realize that this thing is just bigger than you. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are people that'll watch that video and never even think that like who the director was on that, you know, but the idea of just having something that like reaches people, you know, that they enjoy and resonates with them. I don't know. It means a lot. It's like you could think about probably a bunch of, I know that you probably know, but the average person probably doesn't even know the director of their favorite TV show, but it's their favorite show. You Absolutely. know what I mean? So just knowing that I have, I've created something that is bringing people joy or maybe something that really resonates with them in their journey. It's just very fulfilling. And that's, you know, when those videos started hitting millions of views, I think that's when I started realizing, you know, and I got my flowers. Let's not, you know what I mean? I'm not going to say like people didn't reach out. Like I've got so many incredible opportunities just from all the, like I said, every video kind of works as like an advertisement. So a lot of incredible opportunities came from that. So how did the uh, French Montana project come about? Uh, like the, the paper animation, dude. Uh, that was a lot of fun. So that's through my homie Rook. Rook's another director, super talented from Connecticut. For anybody who doesn't know, what video are we talking about? We are talking about the Rushmore Pack music video. Rushmore Pack. Yeah. French Montana. Yeah. So go if you go look, if you go look at all the paper animation on that video, I, I put that together. But basically Rook was like, here's the budget. You got three days. Can you make this happen? So I basically stayed up for three days straight, 72 hours. I went and print, I basically printed out each one of the frames of the video at FedEx. I looked like a psychopath dog. Like they're like, why do you have 800 photos of French Montana? And I was like, well, actually I'm, I'm doing this music video for him. And they're like, okay, okay, yeah, whatever, settle yeah, well, yeah. whatever, dude. Uh, so I go and you know, I, the average person would just do this in post, but I exacto knifed each frame out and that's 24 frames a second, like nerd talk real quick. So for every one second of video, typically, uh, it's 24 frames. So every 24 exacto knives I did would be one second of video and keep in mind then after that, I would have to like take the picture of it too. But, uh, no, the project came out really good. You guys can go check it out online, but I'm really thankful for that opportunity through the homie Rook. It was really dope, you know, French Mont cause I, I, ha I didn't meet French prior to that. So it was nice for him to like comment. I made a post about like how the project came together and he commented on it and showed love. So it was good to see that. But then I ended up doing another video helping Rook out with the, uh, the song was like, you know, the vibes it was with ESTG, but I did mm -hmm. the, uh, VHS footage on that video too. So I actually didn't know that. Yeah, no, I didn't really post about that. That was like low key. What's, what's the name of that song? Uh, I know the hook goes, you know the vibes. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yep. That's why Google was made, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I'm it's a good song, go though. It was out. really good. And, that was, it was, and then it's cool. They were standing on top of like a bodega. It was like a lot that's of fun. Fire. Yeah, yeah, it was cool. And uh, you also worked on something with Roscoe Dash. Yeah, dude. That's an old music video. That's it's a really- about Roscoe Dash. Yeah, dude. No hands, dude. That's not the video I worked on. I worked on- <laughs> <laughs> You hit me with the- I was yeah. like, wait, what? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Girl, the way you do it. Yeah. Uh, no, I worked on a video with, it was a Jonas song and it was a Jonas song originally with Sammy Adams. So I flew out and shot that video and then I went on tour and I had an off day on tour. So I'm like shooting, you know, the shows every single night. And then the morning of, uh, I get dropped off at the airport. I think I was like in Utah or something. I fly out to Atlanta, go straight to the set to shoot Roscoe Dash's part. And then I basically that night, hop on a flight to get back on tour. That was like a crazy 24 hours, but it was a lot of fun too. And you know, Roscoe was really dope to work with. Very nice. Jonas is the man I've worked with him like for years. And then Sammy's also the man. I actually met Sammy through that. And you know, since then I've actually shot another video with Sammy and you know, he's gotten on a song and you might see a, another Mike Squire, Sammy Adams song in the future, dude, real nice. soon. Okay. All right. There's a little Easter egg for you guys. Um, Look out for a possible Sammy Adams, Mike Squires collab. Um, and when did you when did you start filming shows? Mm. So you know, one of the first shows I got, you know, the first first show I ever shot was actually in New York City with a, a group called Kinetics and One Love, 
And if you're not familiar with Kinetics and One Love, you guys got to get familiar. They wrote Airplanes by B.O.B. They wrote like The Hook. Okay. You know you know the song I'm talking yeah. about? So they did that, but they're super talented. But that was the, it was at the Webster Hall in New York. That was like the first show I ever filmed. But I, I slowly started getting more opportunities. You know, my homie Liam, he worked for this blog called College of Music. And one of the first- I College of Music. One of the first times I really ever filmed on like a big stage was for a, a Big Sean show. And uh, no, it was really cool. And Mike Studd and Huey Mack were opening. Mike Studd goes by Mike now. But uh, was that at uh, Western? It was. That was at Western? Yeah. No, like right. The college? Or Westcon. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah, Western Connecticut. Yeah. In Danbury. Correct. I was at that show. That's crazy, yeah, dog. That's that was, crazy. That was one of the first shows I've ever filmed, dude. And, and with uh, K Sean, shout out Coffee Beatty. But uh, yeah, no, nah, we were there and couple other people that's crazy well that's yeah. i didn't meet ian there but ian was one of the people that helped put that show together wow. and if you guys don't know ian ian is my homie who ran tuxedo junction we could actually talk about that too okay. uh because i was the video guy at tuxedo junction which was a nightclub in danbury and that's where i filmed a lot of shows and was able to get really good at my craft and level up quickly it was also a very solid stream of income but there's a little bit of controversy controversy around tuxedo junction because ian uh my homie my good friend whose podcast studio we're in right now absolutely Shout uh, out ian. he went to jail for a half a million dollar ponzi scheme and uh you know served his time got back out but i learned a lot from being at tuxedo and i met a lot of people because all these artists were coming in and out of the venue it forced me to get good at my craft because i was shooting so consistently so yeah. Had to learn fast. I had to learn fast too. So, you know, yeah, definitely tuxedo is definitely a huge part of like my come up and yeah. So speaking of Ian and, um, you know, his, uh, Ponzi scheme, uh, you had some footage from an HBO documentary used. Oh, let's go, dude. That involved Ian and yeah. that whole scenario. So I forgot about elaborate that. Elaborate on that a little bit if you can. Yeah. So HBO reached out to me. It was probably 2019 when they reached out. Okay. And this was actually kind of a long process because the documentary didn't come out to like 21 or 22. It had to be 21. Um, but anyways, so HBO reached out to me and they're like, hey, we're interested in licensing all your footage from Tuxedo Junction. And dude, I went back and forth with them on you know, negotiating forever because basically I had the entire documentary in some senses where it's like I had all the the footage of the venue because I was a resident videographer. So basically I went back and forth with them. It took like two years to agree on a price, which is kind of crazy, but they came out to my house. They came because I couldn't send it to them because I, I don't think they would have used it regardless, like if I sent it to them, but they, to make me feel comfortable, they came to my house and HBO was like sitting in my living room with me reviewing all my footage. And uh, they really enjoyed what they saw. I had like early footage of Ian. And um, yeah, we came to a price. And I ended up getting that check like right after, like probably somewhere in 2020, which was a very clutch time to get that check because, <laughs> you know, quarantine, you yeah. know, I, you know, I do a lot of touring. So touring wasn't happening that much in 2020. So I had to like really figure out some stuff in that year. Okay, so you're you're good at uh giving me the alley oop here because um you are a man that is well traveled. Yes. You've been all around the world, hundreds of countries, I'm sure. What a blessing, dude. Bunch it really states. is. It is. I mean, you know, um they say, you know, it's good to travel and expand the mind. Um and obviously because of your craft, you have traveled a lot due to uh tour. I don't so, want to get too emotional, but dog, like So tell us about your tours, tell us about who you've hit the road with, yeah. some places you've been, your experiences. You know, when I picked up that camera for my soccer videos, I never really thought that it would turn into like traveling the entire world. And I haven't gone like everywhere, everywhere, but you know, I've toured the U.S. multiple times at this point. I mean, I'm, I'm hitting, I'm probably getting close to double digits. So I've been to every state like a good amount. I've been to Europe a bunch of times. I've had some cool one-off opportunities. I've gone to Mexico. I've gone to Jamaica. Um, been to a lot of cool places. But, you know, a lot of those times I was traveling with my homie Watsky, who's an incredible artist. 
And uh, you may be seeing a podcast with Watsky very soon. Okay. Another another Easter egg. Yeah, I'm just dropping them today, dude. And then another one, I, I tour with Webby a lot, Chris Webby, who's also Connecticut artist. And you might be getting a Chris Webby, Mike Squire song soon, dude. Okay. Wow. Yeah. No, there's a lot of good things happening, I guess. But yeah, you know, that first time, I just remember, I think the first time I ever toured, I left in the first, it was the first time I was in Arizona ever and. You know, I've never saw the desert prior to that, you know, mm -hmm. so it's cool. And you really get to see and appreciate the rest of the country. And I really learned that I really do love Connecticut. You know, there are a lot of beautiful places out there, but, you know, I really do appreciate home and I really do appreciate where I'm from and I appreciate my community. And I'm just like very thankful for my Connecticut community. So shout yeah. out to Connecticut. Yeah, Shout dude. Shout out to fucking Connecticut, man. <laughs> and yeah, tour, you know, tour is just like a fun thing, dude. Like, I know it's work and I'm doing videos and photos. And it's a, it's not for everybody, dude. Touring is like... It's grueling. Yeah, it's intense. Like, especially depending on how you tour. Like, my first tour was like in a car, you know what I mean? So we're driving around and those drives are brutal in a car. Like, you're not sleeping much. But it's part of the grind and it's, you know, some of my favorite cherished memories... I remember on my one of my first tours, it was I was working with the opener wit on uh, Watsky's Times Infinity tour, and we had this long drive. We had this terrible long drive from like Seattle to San Diego, and all I remember my food on that ride was pizza Pringles and gummy octopuses, dog or octopi, <laughs> excuse me, dog. I like get sick anytime I like pass those things in the grocery store now. Like from that experience, dude, I like was so dizzy because we were driving through the redwoods. And if you know anything about these redwood roads, they're just so windy and I'm in the back. So it's like, but yeah, no, so that I'm just trying to point out the grind of tour. Like tour can be like grind, but then, you know, as you level up, you get the, you get the van and the van, you can sleep in the van a little bit better and you know, it's nicer. And I've done the van tours and it's good. It's still a grind. You still got to wake up early and there's like van calls and stuff like that. But I've also had the luxury of doing bus tours too. Now the bus tour, my friend, is the most supreme tour of all time because yeah. you you go in, do the show. Uh, in my case, I'm like making sure I'm filming the show, filming the artist, filming the crew, getting photos. And yeah, make sure you're doing photo and video because typically what I like to do is deliver a video recap every day and like a hundred photos. So your boy is grinding out there. And sometimes I'll go even a step further and do that for the openers on the tour as well. You know? So... And that's like a good tip. Like if you're getting on tour, like you can make a little extra cash by like working with the openers. But when you're on a bus tour, you know, when you finish shooting at the end of the night, you just kind of crawl into your mobile home of a, a bus, get your editing done, roll into your bunk, fall asleep, and you're in the next city, dude. It's like teleporting and there's nothing quite like that, dude. Yeah. Yeah. That's, um, it's surreal because, um, it's, it's, I, I think touring is just like such a unique experience. Because, you know, that's work. You're going to work every day, but it's never in the same place. Yeah. You know, so I, it's it's a very unique uh, experience, I feel like, being like an artist and, and a touring artist especially because... I want to talk on the business side of it a little bit, though, too, you know, because my first tour, I didn't get paid anything. Like, I just did it because it was a cool opportunity. Mm -hmm. And to be honest, you know, after my first tour... I didn't have a sense of security by any means. You know, after I did the first tour for free, I don't feel like I was going to be in a position where it could be a viable career. So I was actually about to leave touring and, you know, for a couple other reasons too. But so as I, I was thinking of leaving touring, uh, Watsky hit me up and he basically hit me up like a couple months later because I was somewhere, the point I was in my life, I was like, oh man, I don't know if I should do this. Like, I don't know. I like just spent so much time like building this up and I don't know if this is going to be for me. And then Watsky hits me up and he gives me a rate that was better than any opportunity I've had in my life to that point. And uh, no, I got on the tour with George and it was the Welcome to the Family tour. And it was very ironic of that name because I felt very welcomed, you know, and that crew, you know, Camila, Kush, everybody, Cootie, they were just so welcoming and amazing. And, you know, it really showed me like, this is like how a tour should be run. And not only that, you know, I'll talk on George a little bit too, because it's weird because he's one of my good friends and homies, but I'm very inspired by how George runs his operation, like how he treats his people, how he runs his team. And it's like, 
that's something that I've carried over into everybody that I work with as well too. So, you know, just being very positive, caring, like really approaching things with compassion, like, and it, I think it just builds your team stronger. So yeah, that's just one thing I want to say on that. And it's been inspiring to me. So, um, we, we talked a lot about your video experience and touring. Yeah. But when did you get into music production? Yeah. So I was always doing music production on the side. Like I was, when I was doing videos, if I wasn't shooting a video, I was home making a beat. And so they kind of grew together, but music didn't become a career up until like 2016, 17. So in 2017, uh, I had a big moment where my song come home with my homie Pimo went absolutely crazy on the viral charts on Spotify. And that was a catalyst because of a YouTube page called Swaggy Tracks. So Swaggy Tracks posted the song, then the soccer page picked it up, and then from there it blew up on the viral charts. And at this point, that record's over 10 million streams. I don't know exactly where it's at, but... It's crazy. You got to understand, I was in Mexico at that time on a video gig. And so keep in mind, I'm already like very excited with where I'm at in life. And I'm shooting this video gig with my homie Dan, who actually came on the podcast. And we talked about it a little bit. But... uh. Yeah, so I go back to my phone because I was leaving my phone plugged in into like I didn't have service anywhere and it was just like I left it like plugged in on like a wall outlet somewhere just like leaving it by itself. It was a little sketch to do that, but whatever. Uh, And then I come back and I see like 40, 50 texts and it's just from like all my homies and it's just like, yo, your song's blowing up. Like I'm hearing it everywhere. Like, dude, it just hit like 100,000 streams and I was just like, I have my hands on my head. I'm like, Dan. And then keep in mind, I'm in Mexico, like having the time of my life. I was like, damn it. Things are getting better, dude. Like the song is blowing up and it really was an insane moment, dude, for me. And I think it just, I always have been a firm believer in believing in myself. You know, my whole phrase is believe before the world does. But it that, in that moment just showed me that, you know, the things are possible, dude. You can really make these things happen. And, you know, it was cool because I've been known as like the video guy, you know, up until that point. But now it's like. I guess I'm the video guy and the music guy now. Yeah. So that you just don't have to do one thing in this lifetime. Something about you that I've always noticed you, your branding has always been, you know, top notch. You know, you brand yourself like an artist. I right? do, dude. Um, and it's not when you think of Mike Squires. Yeah. You think of the person, but it's everything from, you know, I feel like it's a very, uh, uh, I wouldn't say carefully crafted because it feels like it is genuinely, genuinely you, authentically you. You know, you've got the uh, the the bright windbreakers, and you, you know, as we speak right now, you're literally wearing a windbreaker with your name on it. You know, <laughs> we've got you've got your name on the podcast, Mike. So, where did you learn uh, the importance of branding yourself in such a way? Yeah, my mom has always been into marketing, and she's like very. You know, she'll throw tips at me and stuff that I like have carried. But I also realize with, you know, being a director, being a producer, those are background jobs, dog. Those aren't limelight jobs. I mean, director sometimes, you know what I mean? But like for the most part, like those aren't the people that are at the front. Like the actors are at the front. The singers are at the front. So I just kind of wanted to be different in that sense where it's like, you know, you could be a producer and be a front. And I think I like branded myself as an art. I see a lot of people doing it now, but I definitely branded myself as an artist producer before a lot of people were doing it. I definitely wasn't the first by any means. Cause you think of like artists like Timbaland, you know what I mean? Who's just like, he had a whole album before, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So it's like, I'm not the first one to do it, but you know, it was something that was important to me that I thought would make me stand out a little bit more if I treated myself as like, you know, treat myself as this main character. And it also makes the fact that I do all these different things in my career a little bit easier to consume because, you know, when you listen to a song of mine or watch a video of mine, it is the same me. You know what I mean? Like, there's no confusion where it's like, oh, is this a different Mike Squires? But no, it's like, because I try to put myself out there, like people kind of gravitate and understand it a little bit more. I hope that makes sense. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, And you've got your face on, all your album covers and, you know, you make it a a point that people know this is who I am. This is what I look like this, you know, and, um, you know, I feel like at one point you were the background guy. Not many people knew what Mike Squires even looked like, but now 
you'd have to not be paying attention to no, to not know what you look like. So I've really made a conscious effort to like put my face out there. And it's cool though, because I don't think I would, not that I get recognized like crazy by any means, but like it would be zero if I didn't put myself put out there, up, yeah. you know, and it'll, I mean, I had a funny opportunity happen recently. Uh, I was at Cobb's Bread in Stanford. Are you familiar with Cobb's Bread? Cobb's Bread. It's like a bread. They sell bread there. Okay. Uh, Sarah wanted to walk <laughs> in. Don't say. And uh, the person behind the the counter, Kelly, she was a wonderful, very nice woman. Uh, I hadn't met her up until that moment, but mm. she knew who I was. And uh, she hooked your boy up with a lot of bread. And, you know, it was just like a, that probably wouldn't have happened had I have not been like constantly. Putting your face out there. Yeah. Because I. I'm still 90% doing behind the scenes kind of work, but I'm like just getting into like, you know, starting to put my vocals on songs and things like that. Yeah. Well, shout out to Kelly at Cobb's bread. You know <laughs> shout out I mean? Kelly. I hope Kelly sees this. She, she's amazing. Um, you have done a few remixes. I have, dude. You have, um, hello, goodbye. Come on, dude. Here in your arms. Yeah. I got to talk to you about it. How, dude. how did that come about? Um, you did a remix. What made you, so, you know, cause I, I, I don't know. Um, it's not like a, Hey there, Delilah playing white tees type of super, super hit. Yeah. But it was a hit song. Quite a few people remember it. It's like one of those nostalgia, you know, type of records. What made you say, Oh, I want to, I want to remix this song. And then how did it happen? Hello, goodbye, get involved in the remix. So, I mean, the easiest thing is that it was one of my favorite songs growing up. Like, okay. I absolutely adored that song. It was on my playlist. I had that whole album. Okay. Uh, so there was an original version of that, like a remix that I did with Pimo a couple years ago. And uh, the production is very similar. It's like almost identical. There's like some tweaks on the new, new remix. But, you know, I was just going through and I saw that Forrest, who is the singer of Hello Goodbye, uh, had the post of the acapella. And it said, if you want to remix this, email here. And I was like, huh. So I put this remix together. I didn't mix it yet. I didn't pay to get it mixed because I didn't want to put, like, I just didn't want to put the money into something that, like, might not be a real thing. Yeah. So I sent him, like, an unmixed, like, r rough version. I'm like, hey, Forrest, like, I absolutely love the song. I have this remix I put together. Would love to, like, officially drop this with you. And uh, I think he got back pretty quick. And he was just like, oh, yeah, let's do it. And uh, it was really that simple. I sent it out to get mixed. I had my dude Jose do the incredible cover art that you guys see now. And, uh, you know, I just went back and forth, just really over email, just having, like, good dialogue, and that's how that happened. It wasn't, like, anything crazy. But I will say this. Hello, goodbye. If you happen to see this, you are the absolute man, dude. I just am so thankful that that remix exists. It's one of my favorite songs of all time. The fact that I have a remix of your incredible song just – Makes me warm and tingly inside. So I really, really, really appreciate that opportunity. And he also allowed me to put it on my album too. Like, so it's very, very cool of him. Like he didn't have to do that. And, you know, things like that don't happen in the music industry. Very so, rare, yeah. you know, shout so out I, to hello. Goodbye. Yeah, dude. I'm so thankful, dude. Do you think uh, we'll see some more music from you guys together? I would love point? to, you know, we haven't spoke on it at all, but man, that would be incredible. Maybe I'll touch base and just the streets yeah. want it. The streets want it. The streets want I'm it. I'm the representative of the streets. They told me, Hey, Squires, hello. Goodbye. Make it happen, bro. That no would be, record. yeah. Hello, goodbye. I'm going to reach out to you. I'm going to send you an email like this week. I'll send it to you in the new year. And you uh, you also re remix one of Atlas's songs. Yeah, the, the, <laughs> the You're a Fucking Bitch. Hope you know that shit remix, dude. That's fucking awesome. Also, another person. Atlas is the absolute man, dude. So I actually have collaborated with Atlas a couple times. Um, So the first song I did with Atlas was Take Me Home. And that was a song that like was very personal to me that I like partially wrote uh, about my house burning down. And, uh, you know, I knew I needed like these strong powerhouse vocals. And I, I reached out to Atlas. I would be like, yo, would you perform this with me? And he took what I had and put his twist on it. He wrote a lot of it too. And, uh, you know, that song is really special. And then I think I did, I think it was the inner piece hook. Like I had the inner piece hook done, although your fucking bitch came out faster. So I, I had inner piece, which is another record I have with Atlas. But then after inner piece, Atlas's song, You're a Fucking Bitch, started getting momentum. And he reached out to me. He's like, yo, would you love to remix it? And I was like, yo, 
I would love to remix this, obviously. And then I reached out to my homie Pimo and Abstract, and they ended up getting on the record. And that's how that record, like the remix came to be. And again, super thankful for my homie Atlas. Uh, he's grown a lot in his career, like since I've met him. So it's been really awesome to see. I've told Atlas this personally. I'll tell, I'll say it on the pod. Atlas is going to stadiums, dude. I'm telling you, he's like the next big superstar. And like, he's already transcended on so many levels, but I'm telling you, dog, like he's going to level up to like the next, next level. And I'm very, I'm here for it. Okay. Okay. Um, shout out to Atlas. Shout out to Atlas. Shout dude. out to Atlas. We're on the topic of music. Okay. Let's talk about what you would consider your debut solo album, mm. Sample Tape Volume 1. Yeah, let's do it, dude. Let's talk about Sample Tape Volume 1. Sample Tape Volume 1 was fun. You know, that project kind of started in quarantine, too. I wasn't able to tour when I was touring a lot, and that's how I made most of my income, and I just was at home bored, and I was like, I always wanted to make an album. I always wanted to make a producer project, but... You know, the tours would disrupt it for one reason or another. It would just never would get done. So, and I, you know what? I was also coming off of not releasing an album in a long time. Cause prior to that, the last album I released was life is good with Pimo in 2017. So I started getting the itch of like, yo, I haven't dropped an album in three years. This is freaking me out. Uh, so I decided to put my head down, work on that album, you know, got a lot of the city involved. So it's a mix of like my friends that I've met on the road and people that I've worked with. And then a lot of hometown artists, you know, you're on there, you're on world domination, got obese on there. I'm proud. And he's on, he's on another record on the, he's on drive slow too. But yeah, no, it was kind of a mix of all my worlds. And that project was really just to show me that again, it's possible. Like I can do an album, put it out and it work out for me, you know? So a lot of the time I feel like I'm just trying to prove to myself that I can do these things, you know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, and I remember the, uh, you know, the release party. So you know? much fun, dude. The release party was dope. Uh, I was in Norwalk. Um, and you brought the city out. You brought a lot of the guys that were on the project. Um, you know, uh, you had some performances and uh, it was dope. It was dope. Um, by the way, I had the best verse on world domination. <laughs> but, oh, uh, crazy, dude. Yeah, yeah this <laughs> Lots is a, of smoke, yeah, dude. Yeah. Um, You're gonna get a message from Doss, dude. Get a message from everybody. I know he's gonna slide. I, yeah, yeah, Frankie. I cooked Sony. everybody on there. <laughs> um, you also have a photo book. I do have a photo book, dude. Uh, so we talked about we talked about video. Yes. We talked about music. Yes. You also are. You know, I feel like. You don't utilize it much, but uh, you're very capable of it. Um, you've got the eye for it. You're a photographer. Yes, dude. Um, and you made a photo book, so let's talk about that photo book. I also have the photo book, by the way. If you guys don't have it, go to his website. Yeah, Believe Before the World does. I actually Before have a few copies does. in right now. Yeah, go go get you uh, go get you this book. This, I mean, the photography in it, it's just... Um, I mean, I'll let him talk about it. I don't want to. I'll give you an honest to God answer on my photography career because it's kind of silly. Um, so going back to touring, Watsky reached out to me. And when he hit me up, he was like, yo, I need a, a videographer and photographer. This is the rate. And at the time I was only doing video. So I was like, oh, oh, OK. Yeah, I'm going to take the gig. And really, when I hopped on that tour, that was like the first time I really ever did photo. Mm. So I kind of forced myself to learn. I mean, I prepped for it. Like I was like doing my homework. I was researching. I was ready for it. But when George hit me up originally, I like wasn't a photographer by any means. So it kind of goes back to the tuxedo thing. Like I was shooting every single night of that tour and I got better just from shooting every single night. You know, I was looking, I was like, if I didn't like what something looked on the first night, I fixed it on the next and little by little. And then... I was able just to stack up an archive of photos. So then I got, you know, I had all these photos from these tours, my travels and things like that. And the pandemic hit. And it was another one of those things where it was like, you know, I have all this time. I always said I wanted to do this project. Now's the moment to do it because I have all this time. I'm not doing anything else. So yeah. I don't think the photo book would have happened if uh, the quarantine didn't happen but I'm very thankful it didn't, you know, that whole, the name of the project is believe before the world does. I said it earlier, it's my motto, but you really just got to believe in yourself before anybody else. Cause no one's going to do it for you. And you know, I'm sure if I asked everybody, like, obviously my inner circle is going to be like, yeah, do it. But you know, 
I'm sure if I asked people for permission in every step of my career, I'd get different answers. Like I'm started out as a video. I was like, Oh, do you think I should start doing video? Well, I don't know. Should I start doing music? I don't know. Like these, you know what I mean? It's like, you just got to take the initiative yourself. Like forget what everyone else says, because they're not you. They're not going to, they're not making whatever you want happen. You got to follow your vision. You got to follow your dream. It's got to be you. You can't listen to the other people. So prioritize yourself, make it happen for you. If you believe in yourself, that's all you need. So I'm going to put you on the hot seat a little bit. I love it, dude. So this is a two-parter. Okay. One. Yes. What of, you know, photography, videography, music, everything that you do, right? Anything, anything else you do, songwriting, whatever. What, A, would you say is your favorite to Mm. do? B, what do you think you're best at? Mm. So it's an, it's kind of an interesting question. I know one of them I prefer more from like a business standpoint. Okay. And I prefer music from a business standpoint because with music, I'm actually building something and I get royalties from that. You know, where I do a music video, I get paid one that one chunk payment. and yeah. that's it. But I really like the idea of like building something up. So from that point, I really do enjoy music. But uh, from a storytelling point, I love video. You know, a lot of my videos are story driven and I like making people feel something. And, you know, there's, so, I got love for all of them. It's hard to pick. It's like, you're asking me to pick a favorite child. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like, everybody's got a favorite child on the low though. Yeah. Mm, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but to, to bring that home, it's like, they kind of, I've always wanted to be a one-stop shop, right? Mm-hmm. Where it's like, you know, you could come to me And not only could I produce your song, but I could do the video and I could do the cover art and I could do, you know what I mean? I could do the whole, I'm the Swiss army knife, dude. So it's always been in my dream since the beginning to be able to do all these different things. And there is an argument where people say that, uh, I am spreading myself too thin doing all these things. But to that, I say, I don't care. Like, fuck them. Like, because I'm happy with where I'm at. It's what I want to do with my life. And I think you got to understand, I spend all my time doing this stuff. Like if I'm not doing videos, I'm doing music. If I'm not doing music, I'm doing photos. Like I'm not messing around, dude. I'm not partying. I'm not, and I never have too. That's the thing. So it's like, and maybe that's a bad thing too. You know, we could talk about that, but like I probably should prioritize a little bit more time for myself, but man, I got some dreams I'm trying to make happen. And I want to Trying to make something happen out here, you know? The only people that do attain these lofty dreams uh, in this crazy business that we're pursuing are the people that are obsessed with it. You know what I mean? I, you know, I have my artist friends and there are people, it's like, I'll know so-and-so, the artist who makes music or does whatever. And then I know them as a person where they're like, oh, they're chilling, watching Netflix, you know what I mean? Hanging out with girls or whatever. I feel like I've always associated, even though we are friends beyond music, I feel like I've always known Squires as the artist in all aspects, not necessarily like just recording artists or whatever, but just the artist, the creator. I've always known you as that. And, um, you know, like you said, oh, I've never been somebody who parties, goes out like that. You know, I, I've I've only, you know what I mean? We'll talk on some just, you know, per- human, you know, yeah. mono a mono friend. You know how you doing? But like often it's like you're 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 doing art. You're yeah. creating in some way. If you're not doing music, you're, you know, working on a video. If you're not working on a video, you you were working on your photo book. So um and uh, it's never been a doubt in my mind that you're somebody who uh, separates himself from those people who say they're serious, but I have their, very, their follow through isn't what yours is, is, you know. Yeah, I have very few friends that mm-hmm. aren't grinders or hard workers. Yeah. I surround myself with people that are winners, people that I see wanting to make something greater of themselves, you know. And that's not to say anything less of the people that don't, you know what I mean? Like, and it separates the people that really want it from the people who say they want it, but aren't, they don't have the follow through. You know I'm I mean? very passionate. And I really believe that you are the sum of your circle. Absolutely. And I, I've said this before, dog, if you hang around a bunch of bums, guess what you're going to be. You're going to be a bum, dude. You're more likely to be a bum. It's not a hundred percent, but you're 
But if you surround yourself with winners, people who actually want to change their life and are trying to level up and people that are leveled up, you're more likely to do that because they're, you're just surrounded by the energy all the time and it's going to just, you're going to pick them up. They're going to pick you up. It's going to be a good vibe. So I recommend evaluating your circle. If you're not where you're at in your life, evaluate your circle. And sometimes you got to make some hard choices, but if the people that, if the people that are around you aren't where you want to be, you might want to consider getting some new friends. I know that's like crazy, like, and they could be longtime friends and you can allow people in your life to a certain degree, right? You, I have plenty of friends that are like smoking weed all day, watching Netflix and I love them. They're my homies. You know what I mean? But they're not the people that I'm like keeping in my circle, trying to level me up and take things to the next level. So absolutely, your circle is very, very important. Have you ever turned down an opportunity? I think all the time, to be honest, because if I'm not passionate about the project, like especially with music videos, if I'm not passionate about the song, I don't think I'm the right guy for it. You know what I mean? Like, and I think that would be a disservice to the artist if I'm not passionate about the song. But there was one opportunity that comes to mind that was one of my bigger opportunities. I got offered six figures. Uh, This is one of the biggest offers that I, monetarily, it was one of the biggest offers I've ever got. Uh, I was offered six figures uh, by Jelly Roll. And he wanted me to come down to Nashville and live with him and be his photo video guy. And I inevitably turned it down, not because I don't love Jelly Roll. I love that dude to death, but I just didn't have it in me to pick up my life. And like, you know, I value my time with my girlfriend. I value my time with my family. And, you know, there's a lot of other projects that I have that I'm passionate about that I think might have been a challenge if I had moved in with him. But with that being said, I absolutely love Jelly Roll and, you know, I'd love to Jelly, if you are watching this, dude, hit me up, dog. I'm ready to hit the road. Whatever you need, dude. I just can't move in. For anybody who doesn't know, uh, Jelly Roll is a superstar, dude. Superstar. (laughs) I I think uh, a clip of his went viral. He was accepting a a country music award. Incredible, dude. And he had like this super inspiring like speech. And I mean, it kind of touches to the general. theme of this episode yeah um i don't remember it for verbatim but it was something about the how, windshield's bigger than the rear view mirror for uh, a reason uh, exactly okay yep yeah. that was it that was it and um you know he kind of got at the fact that you know how ma- no matter how many times he failed no matter how long it took he didn't stop yeah and he's got so he's somebody who just has me inspired too and it's like because you know everyone acts like the music industry is a young man's game right And, you know, Jelly's in his 30s having the biggest moment of his life right now. And that just gets me excited, too. One, because it's obviously the homie, you know, and he played us his album in uh, Echo. My homie Echo was doing a couple shows opening up for him, and he played us his album. And then that album turned into, you know, his big hits, you know. Son of a Sinner is an absolute massive song. Uh, But you knew in that moment, too, that it was going to be big. But... Yeah, dude. I actually, I really would love to connect with, I actually saw him recently in Bridgeport. We hung out. (laughs) My girlfriend, Sarah, did a shot with him. And uh, no, so it was good seeing him too. And, you know, get to talk to him and like congratulate him on everything that's happening. But, you know, I would love to work with Jelly in some capacity. I just probably couldn't move in. Here we are. We're talking. It's December 2023. Yes. We're at the end of the year. How would you say that your year went? And the goals that you set for yourself in the beginning of the year, how do you think you did on those? I think I did really well. You know, last last year, 2022, I feel like I had a pretty big year. It was sample tape one, and I was very consistent with releasing. Mm-hmm. This year, I was not nearly as consistent, but I wasn't as consistent because I had my head down working on a bigger project. So I had a couple songs. Like, I did not drop this year. I had, like, the Hello Goodbye song come out this year. I had a song with my homie Elijah Kyle and Atlas, movie scenes. So I had, like, songs come out. And then I repackaged everything on a sample tape, too, which I'm, like, very proud of. So I still had an album come out this year, which is, like, definitely a big deal. But my main focus this year, career-wise, was to keep my head down and work on this 50 States project, which we could talk about in a little bit. But that was one of the goals, so I, I think I, I did good on that. Another one of my goals is I kind of took a a little breather from touring 
And uh, I did that because I was just getting run down, dude. I just wasn't feeling inspired by it. I just felt rinse and repeat. And I also felt my health declining. Like, like I said, tour is very taxing. And it's funny. I, I took a, a trip with my homie Watsky. It was untour related, but uh, we basically went swimming in the ocean. And dog, I was so winded, bro. I was like, yo, I gotta, I gotta change something up. So at the tour, like December last year, I was like, let me prioritize my health. Let me start eating better. Let me get in the gym. Let me make this happen. And I got in the gym like 80 times this year, right? So in that time, I lost 25 pounds almost. I was like getting very close to the 25 pounds mark, uh, which is a big deal for me because I was working at it and I just feel overall better. So I knew I had to take a break from touring to get my health right. So that was a goal of mine. So I got my health up and then that was pretty much it. I didn't really have too many crazy goals going into this year other than preparing for what I have coming next year. You did touch quickly on sample tape too. Yeah, dude. Um, we could dive into sample tape two, uh, in, in a little more detail. Tell me about sample tape two, the creative process behind it. And, uh, what was different about this project than the first one? Yeah. So sample tape two, like, you know, sample tape one, I was actually more concerned on like having a good performing album. And to me, that was like putting a million songs on there that were like streaming well. So I kind of wanted the metrics on sample tape one to be really good. That was important to me. And the with sample tape one, the big, big thing though, was proving to myself that I could make an album. You know what I mean? Like kind of breaking the cycle of not putting albums out. And I just wanted to see it happen. With sample tape two, I really just wanted to have fun with it. And I really just wanted to highlight some of my like close friends. If you guys don't know, Jet is the intro of my album. Yes, sir. And uh, somebody new. Yeah, dude. There may or may not be a music video coming for that the day after this podcast. But by the time you listen to this, it'll be out. <laughs> may or may not. Yeah. May or may um. Not. But yeah, so that like sample tape two, I really just wanted to have fun. I wanted to have a good time. I wasn't care. Dude, it was the first time I went to, it was like the opposite of sample tape one where it's like, I didn't care about the metrics at all. I just wanted to make a really good album. And I think for that reason, sample tape two is a way better album. It's more concise. It's better execution. The songs are better. Um, but that's what you want to see, you know, like you want to elevate and grow. And sample tape two was my first attempt. Sample tape or sample tape one was my first attempt. Sample tape two was my second attempt. And you want to see progression in each of one of your attempts. So. Yeah, so, because I do remember, you know, obviously off camera we had talked about uh, which, I asked you which project yeah. uh, you preferred, and you did say Sample Tape 2, you feel like it's a better project overall. And, you know, it, it brings me to my theory about, like, uh, creativity and the business side of music kind of being a bit contradictory at times. And I find it interesting to hear that you say um, Sample Tape 1 was something you focused on the streaming and, you know, getting the numbers on on the, the songs, whereas with Sample Tape 2, it was more of like a free process, like, you know, you wanted to highlight just making good music and you come out with a better project. So, you know, I think uh, it felt freeing, I, I'm imagining. I probably felt like I needed to prove myself more with the first one, too. So that's probably why I was As like... an artist in general. Yeah, you know what I mean? Because it's like, if I... And this is just me, like, and I don't know if this is 100% true, but I'm just trying to think of, like, why I would focus more on the numbers, but... To me, it would be like I'm trying to prove myself a little bit because if I'm coming out the gates as, like, this artist producer and I tell you my album has 10 million streams on the first day, you know what I mean? It's a flex. Yeah, well, people are going to pay attention. I'll be like, yo, who is this artist producer who's... More likely to check it out. Yeah, yeah. you know, so I really did care about the numbers. Uh, but now that I, like, with that splash I made on that project, uh, it is more freeing. Like, I don't care. Like... I really am, and you know, I really am at a good place right now where it's like, I'm not really caught up on the metrics. Like I'm doing everything off of the love. You know what I mean? I'm doing this because I want to do it. However it performs, it performs. I do enjoy the game a little bit. You know, I like playing the algorithm games. I like, you know, I do enjoy the puzzles. I like throwing things at the wall and seeing what sticks, you know? And I've, it's kind of like a, a little bit of a, a gamble, but it's a little bit more educated gamble, like, cause you learn and you learn what works, you learn what doesn't work. And, uh, you know, when it hits, it's rewarding. Cause you kind of work your whole career for those like moments. You know what I mean? It's like, 
having those moments like they might not be huge like overnight thing, but like my career has been very little by little. You know what I mean? And I'm very thankful for that because I'm thankful to even have a career in the arts. Yeah. But, you know, just having those like little by littles, you know, oh, this song did a little good today. It kind of just adds to the the overall picture of everything. Yeah. It's like the uh the snowball effect, you know, slowly. Yeah. yeah. Uh rolling up and turning into a, a bigger a bigger thing. And I like the idea of building up a catalog. Like I said, dude, Absolutely. you know, having a body of work, whether it's video, music, that like people could check out, you know, things that will live longer than I will. Yeah, well that's 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 Russ's that's one of Russ's whole things. It's like he talks about where it's like he's been grinding for years, like you said, little by little by little by little. But when he performs at an arena, everybody knows his music because he's built up a catalog for himself rather than just being like a one hit wonder. Came out of nowhere, super smash song, and then you never hear from him again. You know what I mean? Yeah. So you're collecting, you know, you're building a resume for yourself as an artist, you know, and, uh, you know, years down the line, people will know, come home, people will know. Um, you know, the Hello Goodbye remix, you know, because they've been following you for years and it's not just one big track that just blows up and you had, like, no other tracks before that, you know what I mean? So. And there's only so much you can control, you know? You can really put, try to put yourself in the best position possible, and that's, like, what I my goal is. My goal is just to put myself in the best position possible so that I could succeed. Mm. But none of this stuff is guaranteed. You don't know what your songs are going to do. You know, you you hope that things are going to like, you know, bring things to the next level. But one thing I know is that if I just keep trying and like throwing things, something's inevitably going to stick. You know what I mean? So this game is just once you only lose when you quit. Like, I know that's the cliche. Everyone says it, but you know, I've been able to get by and like live and well in some instances, uh, just by continuing and pushing through and, Searching for opportunities. I don't wait for every opportunity to come to me. I reach out a lot of the times. A lot of the times I'm reaching out. So, you know, I'm somebody who, I'm a hustler, dude. You know this, where it's like, I don't give up. If I don't know what the next thing is, I'm going to figure out what it is. You know, I'm going to go out there and get it and do some sort of crazy project so that I have some sort of direction. Yeah. Um, and there's an excitement in that, uh, you know, trying to figure it out, you know, everything, uh, you don't know what's next, but it's like the joy of like trying to figure that problem out and, and, uh, move on to the next thing. Um, and on sample tape two, you mm. have, uh, you have a few songs with your vocals on them. I do, dude. How many songs do you have on the project with vocals on them? Three. Three. And that is three more than you had on the first one. Correct. Yeah, they're my first three songs singing of all time. So, yeah. uh, what was that like? Was that is that scary knowing I've never recorded my vocals and put them out. Now people can hear them. Yeah. And is there like uh, is that like an anxious feeling or an exciting feeling? Like, what is that like? It kind of goes back to everything. I just like challenging myself, dude, mm-hmm. because it's you know I came in the game as a video guy. I said I wanted to get into music, so I did it. You know what I mean? It was outside the comfort zone, got into music. I said I wanted to get into photo. Like, you know, obviously in that situation, like I had to learn quick, but it's like the best things happen outside of the comfort zone, dude. So, Absolutely. I mean, there was a little uncomfortable. And before those three songs came out, there probably were a hundred other songs where I was like just trying to find my voice in some capacity. But I will say there's a song, Long Way Home, which is one of the songs on the uh, album that's mostly my vocals as a feature on it and uh yeah dude i like i'm very proud of that song and i love that song. i like listen to that song and i'm like damn dog like okay like it, you, i made a song that i enjoy listening to and it's my vocals yeah so i mean that gets me excited too and it just opens up more possibilities you know because i don't think this is my my end of putting vocals on records you know it could be just the beginning but you know what i mean the option is there you know what i mean if that's something i want to pursue and go down like Happy to do it, but I really enjoy doing it. And uh, to put it out, it was a little nerve wracking, like a little bit, like a teeny bit. But I'm just kind of the person that told myself to like suck it up and put it out there and just say fuck it. Full yeah, sound. dude, I I enjoy it. And the thing is, everyone, I mean, I I'm very thankful to have 
the support that I do because I can do something like that. I Throughout my entire career, I have a very solid support system where, you know, I can try something new and people be very supportive, you know, like I'm sure there are people that are like, will judge and whatever too, but I honestly don't care. Like, because at the end of the day, I'm not doing this for anybody else. I'm doing it for me, you know, cause I, it's an outlet for me. And, you know, I hope that it resonates with people and I hope that they enjoy it. And, uh, the feedback's been good overall. So I've been really happy. The song Betrayed that I'm on the hook with, with Was I On Key is like creeping its way to one of my top songs too. So not Stop. only, yeah. So to see one of a song with my vocals on it, even creep into like my top songs of all time is like awesome too. So. Could you ever see yourself uh, going down the Pharrell slash, uh, I don't know if we're supposed to say his name, but Kanye. <laughs> Could you say, see yourself going down like the Pharrell Kanye route where you just become a vocal artist who also produces for himself? I think so. You know, and maybe that's where my career is heading. I still have a little bit more work to do as a producer, I think. I'm my job as a producer, and I would produce my own records, but... You know, I think I got a little more work as a producer to do and, you know, try to elevate my craft in that world. And uh, the key is to always be learning. You know, I mean, there's never a finish point, so always be learning. But, you know, I think after some of these projects that I have coming out now, oh, uh, I'd like to see that for me. I think it could happen. So let's talk about the big whammy, mm. the 50 States Project. Whew. That is what I understand to be your magnum opus what you're you know what i mean you're you know mad scientists with the lightning behind them ah she's finished like you know you're working on a huge ambitious project with one artist from all 50 states correct what the fuck <laughs> i'll tell you why that project came to be uh and you know it, it doesn't exist yet it's about to start rolling out but the idea of this project came maybe November of 2022 because, you know, I had just dropped sample tape, uh, one in May and it was getting towards the end of the year. And I just felt like the plan that I had set in stone for this year wasn't going to work. Like I just had, like I took a step back from my game plan and I think I just was going to do a regular album rollout and I ended up getting sample tape two anyways out this year, but I just felt like my plan wasn't going to be a game changing year. So I needed to take a step back and I was like, what can I do that's going to make some noise and actually be really cool. So I actually was talking to Atlas on the phone and he was telling me about TikTok, and he was just telling me that I got to keep pushing short form content. So I did, I went ham on there and I leveled that up, but it wasn't until I called my homie Ryan Mitchell cakes, Mitchell. And I, I, I just hit him up and I was like, dude, let me pay you for a consultation. Like because he works closely with this artist, Nick D, who's very dope and super talented and absolutely crushing it. They have the, like the Freddie podcast together. They're amazing. Like they're awesome. And I'm thankful to know Ryan from years ago. But so I, I call Ryan. I'm like, yo, let me just pay you for a consultation. Like even just to bounce ideas back and forth. Because I know you're going to hit me with an idea that's going to be dope. So we're going back and forth and we're just shooting ideas at each other. It's like, no, no, no. And he's like, well, what if you did a song with an artist from each of the 50 states? And I was silent. And I was just like, I was like, I think that's it, Ryan. I think that's what I'm going to do. I think I'm going to do a song with it. Little did I know that I would be taking on the most crazy project of my life and the amount of work that has gone into this project so far. And I haven't even started rolling out has been the most intense, logistical, crazy battle of all time because I am doing a song with an artist of each, like an artist from each state, but some songs have multiple artists because I couldn't decide or like I'm leaving a lot open though too. So it's like, I'm as prepared as I can be. I have a good system in place. I got my dude, Jose, who's doing all 50 of the cover arts. I got Shout him locked to Jose. Incredible. Dude. He does a lot of my stuff too. Dude. Jose dude is, is incredible. Amazing. Yeah. Jay Duran designs. Yeah, dude. Fuck it. Jose, check out. dude, Jose is the best in the game. And then I got my dude, Curtis, incredible engineer. So Shout I got them both locked in for the entirety of this project. And basically I start rolling out. I don't have all the songs done. I have a lot of songs done. Don't have all the songs done. So I'm still looking for artists. But the idea is that I have enough to get the project started. And then as I get the project started, I'm hoping to find some really dope artists on this project that happen organically. So it's kind of like, I'm as prepared as I can be, but I just need to start putting it out there, rolling out. So, you know, 
this comes out, this pod comes out at the end of 2023, like New Year's. And uh, so 2024, the 50 States Project is in full effect. And I'm drop. I'm aiming to drop every single week. You know, I've given myself a little bit of like, if I don't get it done within 2024, that's okay. Because I don't, I'd rather make sure the project is really, really dope than like rush it out. Mm-hmm. But I'm trying my best, you know, to get this project out efficiently. It's 50 songs. You know what I mean? It's like, so that's 50 songs, 50, you know, artists that I need to go back and forth, 50 everything. So mm-hmm. It's basically five albums, you know what I mean? Worth of songs I'm trying to get out in a year, so. Yeah, so basically just your average Chris Brown album, you know. <laughs> Damn, dude. Um, 52 weeks in a, in a year, mm-hmm. so, yeah, every week you plan on dropping a new song. Yeah, and ideally the last week would be the album. So we're we're starting in 2024. January. January. Yeah, dude, so if you're listening in now, tune in. And also, I have a page, the Squire Squad page, that I'll be release that I'll not only be releasing the songs early in that group, uh, I'm giving access to everybody to help me find these artists, dude. I you could submit your music there, and I'm That's not, smart. but I'm also not fake, dog. I actually go through and listen to all these songs, and I will say there are some fire artists out there, and I still need a lot of the states at this particular moment in time. But man, is it hard? I'm already learning. It's heart wrenching when I find an artist from a state that I already have, and I'm not against changing songs retroactively if I can, if it makes sense. But, uh, yeah, and no, I'm going to start rolling out what I have and, uh, I'm still looking for artists from each of the 50 States. I mean, minus the ones that I have, but it's enough to get started, but not enough to finish the project by any means. So what are a few States that you have no leads on? No leads. Like none. Like- um, yeah, no leads. I'm trying to think, uh, Arkansas. Mm. Um, <laughs> I have to like look at the graph, dude, because it's like, it's more than my brain can even attain. Like I have like a chart where it's just like everything shows the artists that I'm considering, the artists that are locked in, you know, the stage it is in the process. Uh, but yeah, there's definitely a couple, but if, if I haven't announced the song yet, I'm still looking, mm. you know what I mean? Some songs are done. But I'm also very open to changing the songs retroactively, too. I've already done that three times before this project has even started. Change songs retroactively because I found somebody else who was cool uh, that I really enjoyed their music and I really want them to be a part of the song. So basically, I'll, I'll just tell you, I'm starting with Connecticut, starting the home home team, and then 49 others, you know? Video, photo, music. Correct podcast podcast dude this is a new uh a new lane you've trudged down yeah Um, what uh what made you want to start a podcast this year honestly the opportunity just presented itself you know i've helped my homie ian for like a long time you know we've been friends for i mean since the tuxedo days which is like touching a decade i think we're past a decade uh so i've been friends with ian who has the locked in with ian bick podcast and uh you know He'll tell this story too, but uh, like a year ago, he he was posting TikTok. I was telling him, I was like, he was working at Whole Foods and I was like, dude, you just need to get on TikTok. And uh, he got on it. So he got on TikTok and he's posting about his story about going to jail and everything. And he calls me one day, I'm in like Rhode Island or somewhere and he calls me, he's so sick. And he's like, dude, I'm not, I'm not going to post. Like, I'm just so ill today. I can't do it. And I basically was like, shut up, dog. Make that video, post that. And of course, that's the video that hits millions of views, dude. So, you know, I'm very excited for him. And I'm glad that happened because I've known Ian for a very long time. And he's a very, he's an entrepreneur. Like, so, and there's nothing wrong with working at Whole Foods. But like, when you know, like, if you know that your homie is like, has an incredible talent or drive for something, to see him not do that is like. A disservice. Yeah, you know what I mean? So I was like, I know, I've always known Ian as a grinder, so. You know, he's built his socials and he built his podcast and, you know, we both are still in Connecticut. So he just was like, you know, I have a podcast studio now. If you want to shoot a podcast, he's like, I know you have the guests. So that's really how the podcast came together. And, uh, you know, he pushed me to start doing the pod. And I think it's also good now because it's a time where like podcast clips are thriving right now, you Mm -hmm. know, so I think it's good. And another way that I can really show off my network of people too, because I have so many cool people that I'd love to bring on my podcast, but you probably wouldn't know 
that I know them just because there's no opportunity for us to collab because they're not artists. They're like more behind the scenes people. Yeah. Like recently I had uh, David Lotwin and Doug Graham on the most recent pod before this. And uh, I mean, they, they're the creators of D and D studios. They uh, recorded a lot of Jay Z's first albums, but we've never worked on anything. I just know them, you know, and they're good friends of mine, but it's just cool to have like people like that on. So, um, do you plan on, do you have any plans on getting back on tour? I do have some plans to get on tour. You know, I told everybody I was hitting the requirement because I was really feeling burnt <laughs> out. I like that. Yeah, dude. I was really feeling burnt out at the end of 2022 and I was getting fed up, dude. And I just like, because tour is pretty repetitive, dude. And I had no plans, but I was enjoying it too, because you know, with the, one of the more recent Webby tours, uh, you know, I was performing on that tour as well as doing photo and video. So it was kind of cool to get like the best of both worlds on that one. So I really want to get back out there and do that. I did a tour with Watsky this year because Watsky went on his like last tour. You know what I mean? But typically, you know, me going on tour this year compared to how I, I mean, some years I was on the road nine months of the year. You know what I mean? So like me doing one tour is like a major cutback from where I was but yeah, no, I think I want to get back on the road. I think it might be cool to bring the podcast on the road a little bit. I think it'll be cool to do content for the 50 States project out on the road. So a lot of reasons on top of like, you know, if I'm able to perform my own music and uh, doing photo and video, it's like all stuff I love. So I was thinking about uh, getting back on the road this year. Like, like 2024? 2024. Yeah. I have a couple opportunities. I have four tour opportunities because the opportunities didn't stop coming in. I kept, people kept hitting me with them and I just was like, ah, guys, let me just sit out this one. Let me sit out this one. Let me yeah. sit out this one. Uh, so right now I have four opportunities, but yeah, I totally can see myself getting back on the road this year. What would you say keeps you motivated? Mm, I don't got anything else, dude. This is it. This, this is, is plan my- Plan A, plan B, plan Z. Yeah, no, yeah. this is this is it, dude. It's This works or it doesn't, you know? And I'm just going to keep grinding until it does because I don't care for anything else. This is where my passion is. This is where my love is, you know? I don't want to live a life where I'm unhappy and everything I'm doing right now is what makes me happy. So I can't do anything other than this because I'm somebody who, you know, if I get down, I I get down, dog. Like I can't. If I get, you know, not that I get like fully depressed, but if I'm not doing what I want in life, you know, it, it, it hurts. Like I just need to be working on something. I need to be creating something. And I'm really, really blessed that I've been able to like turn it into a career and do it over for, for a decade now, dog. That's fucking nuts. Yeah, no, that is, um, yeah. it's insane and still growing, still growing. Yeah. You know? And you know, I feel... I feel a sense of security too, because, you know, when I started out, you you don't have that like sense of security. You don't know what the next thing is. But at this point in the game, you know, I have a very strong network of people where it's like, I know that if I was like really down bad, that I could like reach out to somebody in my circle and be like, Hey, like, do you have something that I could do? Do you have something that I, you know what I mean? Uh, thankfully I'm not in that position, but basically my network kind of keeps me as like my little insurance policy that keeps me going where I'm willing to take a little bit more risks because there's a net if I fall, you know what I mean? So yeah, that's, that kind of keeps me motivated. And then also death dog. Uh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, nah, dude, I We're know that was morbid. Yeah. But like, I want to die like knowing that, you know, I lived the life that I wanted, you know, I want to, not that it matters because once I'm dead, I'm dead, you know, but I really, you know, just want to be remembered. Like, I don't want ever to be like, ah, you know, Squires reg lived a regular degular. It's going to be like, nah, that dude was, he did. And you know Killing what? Me. I also want to be very kind to be like, I very try to stay kind to everybody no matter what, because I don't want to be remembered as an asshole either, to be honest with you. Like, yeah. And I, I really, you know, and that's why I try to like, trust me, I get upset with people, but I'm just like, ah, like, how are we going to fix? Like, let's talk it out and fix it. Like, like, let's not, you know, we don't need to make a big thing out of it. So I think being kind to somebody isn't like everybody is important. And uh, yeah, dude, I don't know, things like that. And I've also, I got a lot of people that depend on me. That's another thing that keeps me motivated. Um, Shout out to Mama Squires. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's like a lot of people that like. And my mom's good on her own, like, for stuff. But, I mean, like, you know, I think 
I have a song called Do Some Drugs, which is one of the, it's my only song with my vocals on it, like all the way through just me, me produce a hundred percent. Uh, and the song is not about doing drugs. It's talking about why I can't do drugs and I can't do drugs because I got people that depend on me. I got people that look up to me and you know, I'm a role model to certain people and you know, if they're looking up to me and depending on me for like what the thing is, I want to be the best possible version of myself I can be for those people so that they don't go down a dark path. To the point you made about, um, you know, when we're gone, we can't take any of this with us. We can't take the streams. We can't take the numbers, right? And you're ultimately defined by your legacy and what you do, the impact you have on people. And uh, we were just talking about that on our podcast, which is interesting. And, um, you know, uh, that's that's respectable, you know, what you said. You know, at the end of the day, you want to just be remembered as a good dude, you know, and obviously leave a legacy as as far as, you know, everything you're doing now with your art. But no, very, very admirable. And, um, you know, you say the 50 States Project. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's one of the things, obviously, probably the main thing you're focused on for 2024. But what other goals do you have, if any personal, maybe, you know, music career wise yeah no i think i just got to keep pushing myself dude i think i have to just try to level things up little by little and just keep getting outside that comfort zone because i don't there's no growth in the comfort zone and i really do want to level things up i'm trying to make some plays this year to really move the needle you know so i think that's important to me and yeah just keep pushing myself to discomfort dude we we covered a lot. Yes, covered uh, your beginnings. Yeah, your middles. Yes, and uh, I won't say your ends, but <laughs> not be, yet, dude. Know, <laughs> to be continued. Yeah, um, the story the story rages on. Uh, for anybody who is having trouble getting started, trying to figure out how to get started, or anybody who's in the middle of their career, mm. music are up. Uh, you know, art, dance, whatever it is, what advice would you have for any creatives that are pursuing this and are stuck and looking for the next thing? How do we get to the next, the next level? What, what would you say to those guys? You got to are- take those risks, dude. You have to. And be smart about your risks. I'm not saying risk it all and be dumb about it. You know, make sure that you're in a position that's going to work out for you and, you know, so that you don't cripple yourself in financial debt or any other potential way. But take those risks. You know, if you have the opportunity, like really bet on yourself, take those chances, take the, put the, invest in yourself. That's always, you can never go wrong because if you don't level up from it, you learn something from it. And then, You could take that to the next thing. So always bet on yourself, you know, and try to thrive to like level up. And, you know, if you're trying to, you can only get to the next level from repetition, right? Because you, that's the only way to get better at something. So if you're an artist and you're trying to make music, keep making those songs, keep making those songs. Like you should be making songs. If you want to become an artist, all you should be doing is making songs. And then until you get to the point where you think you're good and you can put them out, or you could even just start dropping them and get good along the way. It doesn't even matter because at the end of the day, you control your life. No one else can do that for you. If you want to become the thing that you want to think, like if you want to become what you see for yourself in your head, you just got to do it and you got to send it, like put yourself in the right, like the, you got to put yourself in the position to like really become the thing. Like look at people that are in your career path. Like if you're, like I said, if you're an artist, look at the artists that are doing it. If you're a video guy, look at the video guys. If you're whatever you want to be, there are people that have done what you're trying to do in some capacity before learn from them, you know, reach out, try to shadow them. I learned a lot from shadowing a lot of, there was a a video director, Hunter Lyon. Before I had my music video career, I would go out to New York city and shadow him. So, you know, you want to just put yourself in position and Take those risks, you know, like don't be afraid, just send it and just know that there are like, there are some risks that you can't come back from. And then there are ones that you can like be smart about the risks that you take, but like take the risks when you can, because you're going to regret not taking them when you're older. I don't know. I'm not older yet, but I believe that 
if I didn't take some of the risks that I'm taking, I would regret them. Hey, it, it depends who, who you're talking to. A 14-year-old could be watching this right now. And to them, you are the OG, you know what I mean? Yeah. We're, you know, we're always someone's OG, you know? So yeah. there, there are probably kids out there looking up to you like, wow, how do I get to where he's at, you know? Which is exciting for me because at one point I was that kid looking up to somebody, you know what I mean? So yeah. the fact that I, like, even get, you know, to potentially be that for somebody, you know, is, like, a big honor. And I'm going to continue pushing for those people. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, you got to believe before the world does. Right? Amen, dude. Um, Mike, I appreciate this, brother. I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to sit out and interview you. Yeah, um, dude, it was really know. good, man. Um, and, uh, you know, anything else you want to say before we close out? Uh, you know, this is the end of 2023 that this episode comes out, the last day. So we're really in 2024 now. And, uh, I'm excited for this year. I really am. I think I'm going to achieve these goals that I'm set out to do. I like talking about it and putting it out there in this podcast because it, in some senses, it keeps me, uh, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? It keeps me accountable Absolutely. for everything that I'm saying. So it's not just you saying it in your room. You're recording it. Oh putting yeah, it out yeah, for people putting to it out see there. It, you know, so but I, I mean, that I st- extra pressure on yourself. I stated my goals. Uh, mm-hmm. I'm giving myself a little wiggle room. But I'm a man on a mission. I'm going to make it happen. Absolutely. I I got to respect it. Got to respect it. Uh, 2024 is the year of the dragon. Um, and, uh, you know, the dragon represents bravery, courage, and uh, obviously they're known for fire. And fire is associated with, you know, motivation. And also 2024 is a gr- year of great significance. Uh, the number 24 is very significant to me personally as well. So I, uh, have a good feeling me for, too, dude. For, for you, for and me, for us, for, we yeah. come out with a music video right out the gates, dude. Absolutely. January 1st, midnight, right when the ball drops, we drop. So let's get it, dude. So Mike, again, thank you for, uh, coming on my podcast. For, <laughs> yeah. Thank you for coming on your podcast. Thank you for allowing me to come on your podcast. No, and thank you, you, dude. I really appreciate you doing that more than you know. And, Ideally, a year from now, we come back and do the same thing. Sitting here in the same same seats. Maybe, maybe different, different seats. seats. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Maybe different seats uh, under different circumstances, uh, different context, but hopefully even Just better. Just you and me in the pod. <laughs> yeah, even better. You know, maybe we're sitting in like a fucking mansion or something. Who knows? Yeah, dude. A lot can happen in a year. Yeah, so. that'd be sick, dude. Maybe we just book out a mansion just for the next one, just in case. Yeah, yeah. Whether or not, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Just get like our best outfits, fucking Versace, Armani, and all this shit. So the 50 States project went well. How did it go? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, on that note, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I don't know how he usually closes this one out, but I think it's my job to close it out. Yeah, you got it. All right. So um, thank you for watching the Mike Squires and Friends podcast. Uh, if you're on YouTube. Hit like, subscribe. You know all the things to do. You got to give the people your thought of the day, dude. Thought of the day. Yeah, I do that every time. Hmm. It's based off of what my guest says typically. Okay. So you'd be like, my thought of the day is this. Something I said on Facebook a few weeks ago, something you actually touched on quickly in this podcast. The only way you can fail is if you quit. On that note, good morning. Good evening, good night, live from the Mike Squires podcast. And most importantly, you need to believe before the world does.